Good evening, everyone. My name is Siddhi Dheer and I'm the Executive Director for Dye Singapore. Welcome once again to one of our sessions under Emerge, which is in collaboration with Google.org, where we are helping small businesses struggling due to COVID-19 COVID on various initiatives, one including business series, the other is helping them go digital. The third is of how of mental wellness, which we did yesterday, and the fourth is global expansion. This particular session is on business series, and we've got a very special guest and a renowned speaker today. His name is Prantik Majumdar. Prantik is the managing director of CXM Group, Densu Singapore. He would be talking on amplifying your brand via digital marketing. Prantik is an entrepreneur and venture investor and acts as a digital transformation catalyst in organizations to drive sustainable and change impact, sustainable change and impact. He started his entrepreneurial journey with Happy Marketer in 2011, where he spent a decade building and scaling up one of the best and most awarded independent digital marketing services firm in the region that served many brands. In February 2019, he had a successful exit with Happy Marketer was sold to an American digital enterprise called Merkle, which is part of the Dentsu Ages Network, the largest Japanese advertising conglomerate. He's currently serving as the managing director of the CRM group at Dentsu Singapore. He's a regular columnist at Marketing Magazine, Campaign Asia, Economic Times, Business Times, on all things digital transformation and marketing, and has trained over 500 enterprises in the region on this subject. In 2015, he was recognized as one of the top 50 most influential marketers in the world. Prantik is also a charter member and a part of the core committee at I Singapore. Over to you, Prantik. Thanks a lot, Siri. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, and uh, you know, very welcome uh, to this. A very warm welcome to this session. Uh, I presume most of you are either from Singapore or India. And uh, you know, thank you once again for supporting Ty and you know joining us for this session. Uh, so I think the agenda, you know, I would kind of keep it very fluid. I have a deck, and I'll obviously take you guys uh, through my perspective on uh, you know what are some uh, points to kind of bear in mind when you think of amplifying your brand and reaching out, uh, you know, to the relevant audience through digital. It's a topic, obviously. I'm sure uh, you know, as startup founders or as owners of businesses or investors, I'm sure you guys would be very, you know, probably very well versed, would have seen lots of examples from different companies, be it startups, SMEs, or large companies. Uh, so, you know, my goal is just to kind of give you a framework uh, based on what, at least what, what's worked for us at Happy Marketer as a company, what's worked for some of our clients, and also hopefully to, you know, share some uh, potential pitfalls that you can avoid. Because I think especially if you're a startup or a independent business, I mean, I'm fairly sure, you know, marketing resources are limited, right? And the question is, how do you kind of go about your digital marketing or marketing as, you know, as a function uh, without, uh, you know, making some of those expensive mistakes, right? Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's what I'll be talking about in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. And uh, in terms of Q&A, we could do it two ways. Uh, feel free to kind of share your questions or comments on the chat. Uh, and otherwise, we'll keep about, hopefully, about 10, 15 minutes for specific questions at the end. So let me try and share screen. Okay, hopefully the screen is visible. And yeah, so, you know, I think one of the fundamental things when I speak to companies or advise them is I think uh, one of the first things you're going to bear in mind is uh, you know, what is the per what's the definition and purpose of digital? It sounds obviously, uh, you know, a philosophical point. But the reason I say this is because every time, you know, you know when, a, when a company comes to us, uh, when I say us as a dense or happy marketer, uh, they come with some a very, very specific needs. Many of them come to us saying, oh, you know what? I, I want to increase my uh, Facebook or LinkedIn follower base by a thousand fans. I want to grow my LinkedIn follower base. Or maybe I want to try TikTok because that's the coolest thing to do. Or, or you know what? I, I've been trying to run Google AdWords and it's not working. So I want to run Google AdWords uh, in, a, in a better fashion. And that's great. So I think one of the things to kind of firstly bear in mind is what is the definition of digital for you and your business? And what's the purpose, right? And to me, as a, you know, as a business owner myself, as as the owner of Happy Market or the business that I've run, or even for our clients, 
one of the things that's always very critical is something to bear in mind is ultimately marketing as a whole and digital specifically it needs to drive growth and business uh, you know i it's important to ensure that you're not just stuck around vanity elements such as you know growing your fan base or growing your email database or uh, you know uh, driving reach to x impressions those are fine those are milestones important to measure but ultimately i think if you're a founder if you're an investor or if you're you know uh, you know someone driving marketing at your uh, small medium enterprise it's important to bear in mind is what does digital really mean in terms of definition and how can i use the right relevant digital channels to drive growth right so uh, one of the things hopefully you can take away from today's session is digital does not necessarily only mean advertising and does not only mean facebook and google ads uh that's one of the biggest myths and biggest challenges with digital most people most marketers who come to us their world view is digital equal to facebook and google ads uh and that's it right uh there's much more to digital and hopefully through a race framework i've tried to simplify for you simplify it for you hopefully you'll try and kind of get a sense of what i'm trying to drive uh, home number one and i'll talk about five you know key things today in the next uh, 30 35 minutes the first thing is i think it's very very critical to kind of know where do you stand in your company's journey uh, who are your right benchmarks and how do you kind of calibrate growth ambitions and the reason i say this is because obviously you know all of us are bombarded with whatever we read in tech in asia the can e27 in tech crunch etc this company has raised 100 million dollars or 50 million or whatever you know they have done this particular awesome marketing campaign so on so forth and i think that kind of fuels our thought and ambitions as to oh i must kind of uh ape that or kind of try and you know do what they have done right but i think it's very very critical to kind of figure out you know what what kind of a company am i or what kind of a company do i want to be what are the resources and hence how do i calibrate my digital growth ambitions right what do i really mean so if you look at this right you will see two broad kind of companies and i've just used these as examples i mean uh, there's no specific reason as to why i've kind of picked these brands but just broadly you know if you look at companies on your left you will see that these are very well known venture backed startups uh, who do or go about their marketing in a particular way right so most of these obviously are fairly uh, you know probably they they've come about in the last 5 10 12 years and they are have digital you know they are digital natives their digital is pretty much inbuilt into their uh, product or their customer experience right so one of the good things about these companies on the left is it's they are digital first or maybe digital only right that's that's how these companies they kind of came in to disrupt uh, existing sectors that's a good thing because they don't think of digital only from a marketing perspective they think digital from a customer experience from a product from uh, you know from a whole entire business perspective right but if you go to the right most of these companies including you know i've put in happy market as a logo there uh you know for us digital started our perspective of digital was very much around using digital as a marketing channel right of course today one can argue that you know dbs income sync posts etc in the last 2 3 5 years you know it, it's they're obviously transforming they're going through the digital transformation programs and digital is kind of becoming core even at a product service level right so whether it's digi banking whether it's direct to customer insurance packages uh digital is becoming core the other difference here is when you look at these two camps is the ones on the left are heavily funded right they are funded by the likes of sequoia wave maker uh softbank so on so forth they have very heavy war chests which means the game that they are playing is a very different game right they have enough cash to burn in fact they are playing the game of quick growth because they are backed by vc money and vc money obviously you know when a vc puts in money he has he or she has a shelf life of about 5 7 10 years which means they need to kind of grow quickly to uh, you know scale up to acquire companies and to kind of uh, you know live that whole winner take all philosophy because you know if you look at all these they're all kind of aiming to become if not already become category leaders right so they are they have the resources they have the backing they have the marketing dollars to kind of burn quick grow fast right at whatever cost on the other side companies on the right could be public listed family owned privately owned and one doesn't have that that sort of marketing budget or resources to kind of grow at that scale so the way you kind of calibrate your ambitions is very very different 
And the reason I put this out there is because there are just too many companies, be it startups, SMEs, or even uh, large family-owned businesses. Uh, you know, when we kind of have our initial chats as to, okay, you know, what kind of uh, marketing plans do you have in mind? Who do you kind of uh, idolize? It's typically the ones on the left because they are the young, sexy companies. But I think it's important to bear in mind that, of course, there's a lot to learn from the likes of Grab, Shopee, Flipkart, etc. in terms of what they do when it comes to digital uh, being, you know, core to their customer experience and product and the way they run data-driven marketing. But again, you've got to be really careful as to, uh, you know, they are a very different beast, right? So I think that's one thing to bear in mind is uh, when you are running your digital initiatives, uh, which paths do you choose, right? So eventually, again, let's say you're a young startup and, you know, you get your series A, B, C funding. It's a very different playbook that you will kind of try and emulate. In fact, if you get a Sequoia on board, I'm sure they have that playbook ready. They will expect you to kind of play or kind of emulate some of uh, some of those factors or pointers in that playbook, right? So that's point number one. Point number two is I think it's very, very critical to kind of just step back and try and figure out what are you trying to do as a marketer, as a founder or business owner when you want to use digital, right? Is again, what do you really care about? Do you care about driving traffic to your website? Do you care about growing your social media fan base? Do you just want to increase uh, the amount of time that people are spending on a website? If you're a B2B company, are you looking at targeting specific accounts through Google or LinkedIn? I think ensuring what is the core purpose of digital, like I was sharing earlier, I think that's very, very important, right? So one of the things that I kind of, what we try and do for ourselves and for our customers is how do you ensure, you know, like I said, digital is way beyond advertising and way beyond the world of Google and Facebook, uh, who are of course a duopoly in the advertising world, right? So if $100 is being spent in ad digital advertising, probably 70 to 80 goes to the world of Google and Facebook. And by Facebook, I'm referring to the entire Facebook network of Instagram, WhatsApp, or Google, I'm referring to Google, YouTube, and the family, right? But the power or the potential of digital, uh, especially for a new age business, for a startup is immense, right? So let's kind of step back. And I'm using some uh, simple examples, B2C examples, uh, you know, again, uh, so that I, I presume everyone's obviously either use these brands or are familiar. Just take a pause and think about What's common about the chief marketing officer or the marketing director or the marketing function in these global brands? So I'll take a pause, use the chat function to kind of share uh, if you, you know, if you have any thoughts or if you know as to what's common about the CMO or the marketing function uh, in these well-known large businesses. Arun says, always be in the memory of the customers. Suresh talks about shifting from print to digital media for marketing. Keep them coming, yeah. Just think about these brands, obviously fairly popular, been around for 50, 70, 100 plus years. I'll take one more if there are any thoughts or comments. Huge consumer-oriented marketing budgets experience, first choice in the minds of customer in the industry, B2C. Yep, most of these are probably barring uh, Johnson & Johnson and Uber in certain markets, everyone's bulk of the business is B2C, right? So of course, you know, these are large consumer brands. They've obviously done a great job in terms of building a brand over the last few decades, et cetera. Uh, they've obviously kind of become, you know, if you talk of fast food, I can't think of any, any person who would not probably mention McDonald's in the top three, right? Uh, likewise, Coca-Cola, et cetera, Johnson, Uber, so on and so forth, right? But if you look at what's common in the recent past about uh, their marketing functions or chief marketing officers, what's interesting is they don't have a CMO. In fact, many of them are, uh, in, in some cases, CMOs are leaving. They're not being replaced. And by CMO, I'm loosely using the term CMO. I'm referring to the marketing function, the traditional marketing function, which is very interesting. And, you know, this is probably a phenomenon in the last two, two and a half years. So, in fact, we'll find enough literature in the press about this, and you guys should read about this, is, you know, these guys don't have chief marketing officers, right? Uh, and there's enough interesting 
uh, reasons as to why this may be happening. And this is, these are just examples, by the way. There are many, many companies, including Fuji, Xerox, Netflix, where in many markets, they're choosing not to kind of have uh, the CMO or the marketing function. Now, does that mean marketing is not important or you know, uh, there's no value to marketing? Not really. So what's really happening is in, to kind of get a good grasp of uh, you know, what, what's happening in the larger, uh, you know, these large companies or many of these digital native startups as well, you know, one very interesting piece of research that I would urge all of you to read is this cover story in the Harvard Business Review uh, in, I think, May or June, or rather July 2017, uh, which it talks about why CMOs never last. It's a great study by Kimberly Whittler and Neil Morgan, uh, which talks about, you know, and we as Happy Marketer realized this uh, in a very hard way around 2015, 2016. And this research kind of corroborated what we were uh, experiencing. You know, when when I go and pitch to a CMO or a marketer or marketing director, typically what we started observing in Happy Marketer was uh, the client was like, oh, you know what? I'm looking to run two marketing campaigns, one for back to school in May, one for a Diwali or Christmas campaign at the year end. Uh, typically they would give us a, a six month contract and then a one year contract. And uh, it was very, very hard to scale that budget. You know, it was very limited budget. And uh, then by accident in a bank, for whatever reason, we were asked to work with the CTO, the technology team, right? Uh, so at Happy Marketer, again, right, broadly marketing agencies, you would have three kinds, creative, media, or technology. We, by default, were kind of a mixed bag of mostly tech and media, not so much of a creative agency. So we kind of started working with the CTO and the CIO's office. And to our surprise, what we realized was, wow, this is very refreshing because A, every CTO project was typically three to five years. Uh, their budgets included both CAPEX and OPEX. They never spoke campaign. And that's when it triggered. And when I read this article, I'm like, wow, this is a great insight. So from 2015, we've literally, at least, and, not, and today it's not just us, many in our industry have actually shifted focus saying, we're not going to work with CMOs. We're going to work with CTOs, found, founders, CEOs of the board. And one of the simple signals for us was, every time I hear the word campaign, I know I shouldn't be pitching because just think of it, by definition, campaign, it's a very myopic thought process. I'm only thinking about next three months, next six months. You're not thinking of, about the bigger picture, about the brand, about performance, about revenue, right? Very few marketers would come to us and say, oh, I want to grow. Uh, you know, when I would ask them, what's your target? What's your KPI objective? Very few would come and say, I want to grow revenue by 2%, right? And if you read the article, that's exactly what the challenge with the marketing function of the CMO is. And that's the reason why CMOs don't last. And that's the reason why these big brands are saying, uh, it's it's not that marketing uh, is not important. It's just that the definition of marketing needs to change. So if you go uh, you know, deeper into the article, so one of the other things it talks about is if you go to a boardroom, you have the CEO, you have the chairman, chairwoman, you have CHRO, CTO, CFO, CIO, CMO. Now, unfortunately, CMOs have the shortest shelf life. Typical CMO lasts about, you know, uh, you know, maybe two and a half, three, three and a half years in this part of the world, and they have the shortest budget. And we learned this again when we started working in partnership with the Boston Consulting Group. And I was enamored by BCG. I was like, wow, these guys are geniuses. They can sell, you know, in consulting, you're selling ideas, thoughts, you're selling PowerPoint essentially, right? And I was like, wow, these guys are able to sell PowerPoint thought consulting frameworks for $10 million, you know, no, or, you know, $5 million, $2 million. There's never anything below a million dollars, right? In this part of the world. And we are struggling here to get 50K, 100K from a marketer. And that's when I realized I learned, learned it the hard way through them is because they told me categorically that, hey, look, the problem is you're going to the poorest guy in the boardroom. Obviously, you're gonna, it's going to be difficult to kind of uh, make enough money from that. So again, point I'm going to make here is I think the function or the role of marketers or marketing is changing, right? It's not that those companies don't need marketing. They need marketing. But what's happening is these roles are being re-Christian to chief growth officer, chief digital officer, chief experience officer, whatever you call it. But what's happening is they are being measured not on reach, not on uh, you know TRPs in many parts of the world. They're being measured on growth, on revenue, on net promoter score, right? On literally you know on uh, the lifetime value of a customer, right? Or, or are you reducing CAC cost of customer acquisition? So again, if you go back to this article, you see that pie chart. What it essentially tells is very few marketers would typically manage PNLs, right? They would typically just look at the aesthetics. In fact, 
uh, you know, if most marketers, again, you know, you would see memes, you would see a lot of articles around how they're so obsessed about the, the size of the logo or the color or the aesthetics. Nothing wrong with it. Those are interesting. Those are important. Campaigns are important as well. But what's important is the mindset that all of that, can I connect the dots and figure out that by having this ad campaign, I can sell more credit cards. By having this ad campaign, I can get more B2B, you know, SaaS, uh, SaaS users onto my platform whatever it is, right? I think it's that mindset of either increasing revenue or reducing cost of customer acquisition. That's what matters. So my point to all of you here is that I think when you plan your marketing, uh, you know, marketing hires or your marketing functions, you got to take a much larger view than just thinking of, oh, what's my content marketing going to be like? What's my social media marketing going to be like? Those are tactics and channels, important, but you got to have broader expectations saying, you know what, whoever is driving my marketing, what is the revenue growth or what's the uh, you know, improvement in lifetime value or reduction in uh, CAC that's important. And something I tell all my, you know, the startups advise or uh, you know, companies that I work on is ultimately whether you're a software company or you know, a FMCG or you are a chicken rice stall somewhere, we're all driven by the formula of profit equal to revenue minus cost. And like I said, as a marketer or as a business owner, either I have to grow revenue or reduce cost. And I think today, you know, with the tools, technology, et cetera, available, I think marketing as a function needs to be held accountable and responsible and needs to be supported to kind of drive growth. So hopefully that's one key point that you bear in mind. And you don't just think the tactics of, hey, let's run Facebook ads to drive traffic. That's a means to the end. It's important. We'll come to that. But I just think there's a lot more out there that marketing can help you achieve. And so philosophically, if you look at it, right? So this is again uh, uh, from a Harvard piece where basically fundamentally what's shifted is when you're thinking of marketing, the goal is to kind of create this loyalty loop. For the longest time, you know, in the in the uh, pre-digital era, if you will, where again, right, many of us would have uh, known friends or families who studied mass communication and the goal was, hey, let's broadcast. The whole term of TV, radio was about broadcast. I'm not saying they don't work. They, they work, they serve a purpose, especially in markets like Indonesia, India, Philippines, print radio is big. Point is, one needs to push marketing and find channels that can help us do more than broadcast. In fact, you know, if you ask me, mass communication to me has very little sense today. One, in fact, needs to figure out targeted, segmented, data-driven niche marketing. Mass communication as a whole uh, alone is not enough. So back in the day, you know, the goal was, okay, I'm going to kind of create some sort of stimulus and some sort of campaign. I'm going to advertise on holding TV radio about my new soap or about my new detergent and hope it reaches the right audience and hope someone's going to come and buy and hope that once they buy, they like it and they'll come, you know, again and again. But again, hope is not a strategy, right? You can't rely on hope as a business strategy. So yes, it's important to kind of create that right buzz, that right reach and right awareness. You've got to ensure that your brand is well considered in the consideration set. You've got to ensure that obviously eventually people buy, but it doesn't stop there. You've got to ensure that you try and then post-purchase, digital can also help you drive customer relationship, ensuring that you know your customers are happy, they've onboarded, they're using it well. And ideally, you want a customer to not just buy once, but buy again and again, but more so hopefully get in more other customers because we all know acquiring new customers is an expensive proposition. You ideally want some sort of advocacy, loyalty, and referral so that your eventual cost of acquiring the right set of customers uh, kind of you know, ensures your CAC is low. So I think that mindset that marketing has to drive beyond just awareness campaigns and to drive growth and ensure that you acquire the right kind of customer at the right kind of price point and ensure that eventually marketing helps you drive lifetime value uh, is important. Yeah. So essentially, fundamentally, the shift that we have you know, moved in the last 15, 20, 30 years is moved away from the spray and pray approach. You know, I'm sure everyone's seen or been to Times Square and you've seen all these ads scattered out there. Sure, at some point, that this was a big channel like TV, right? But again, how do you know if this works? How do you know that by seeing that particular ad and that holding, that Toshiba ad right in the middle top, someone actually uh, you know, considered purchasing it. Can you measure it, right? In fact, we've had so many large clients like, uh, you know, when we started working with the education sector here, with the universities, they would have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars being spent on running ads on FT and The Economist and New York Times. 
And when I would ask them, hey, how many students did you get from this Economist ad when you spent, let's say, half a million dollars uh, on an annual campaign? Obviously hard to say, right? Uh, so there's very little measurement. There's very little attribution. Sure, it builds prestige. I'm sure some people would have flipped and seen, uh, let's say, the Nanyang Business School ad in The Economist, but it's very, very hard to measure success. Uh, and it's pretty expensive as well, right? And the goal is how do you move away from that spray and pray to kind of creating this customer journey and loop, right? The loop that I showed you earlier is how do you ensure that you are in the right media channel, be it digital, be it offline, what have you? Uh, how do you ensure that the right kind of audience is seeing you on the right device and channel? How do you then ensure that your message uh, tells the right story so that your brand is considered? I think amongst all of this, sometimes in the whole digital game, people tend to undervalue creative. In fact, to me, creative is even more important today. The element of brand storytelling is absolutely critical because technology and Facebooks and the Googles can help you reach. But unless you're able to tell the right story, stitch it the right way in the right sequence, in a right dynamic fashion, uh, you know, uh, you, you can reach me. But if you, don't, if you don't evoke emotion and kind of make me consider your brand or love your brand, I wouldn't want to find out more. Uh, and then, of course, how do you get to moment to purchase? How do you then, obviously, if it's purchasing on e-commerce, sure, digital can help. If it's FMCG or retail, you know, how do you ensure that, you know, uh, that your digital helps you, you know, consider the brand? But uh, is there a way? So, for example, I'm sure the likes of PNG, Kimberly Clark, et cetera, today in various categories, they're figuring out ways, if not deterministic, but in some ways to measure that, okay, you know what, I'm not selling it directly, perhaps, but through my retail partners or e-commerce partners, I can get enough decent data points to understand who's buying what, but where, and how do I optimize my, you know, this customer experience journey cycle. So remember, the goal is not just to spray and pray and hope that people see your ad and buy, right? Those days are gone. You can definitely get marketing to kind of do a far more intelligent job to push a customer closer to a sale and then ensure that there is hopefully repeat purchase and hopefully some advocacy to bring in friends and family so that uh, eventually your cost of acquisition goes down and your lifetime value hopefully goes up. Yeah. So I think this is a fundamental mindset shift and it's important to kind of discuss and put it out there in the open because like I said, most people today still think of digital as an advertising exercise. Right. And one thing, you know, again, philosophically, since we're talking about at a conceptual level at this juncture, you know, I think fundamentally, what's the point or the whole essence or goal of marketing? Right. Uh, one of the simplest ways to kind of tell you this is, you know, there are three kinds of customers, no matter what business. <laughs> it's a yes, no or a maybe. Yes, meaning there are customers who, who love you, who love your brand and they're going to buy from you no matter what. Right. And then there are no's who will not buy from you no matter what. And then there are perhaps a big group of maybes. To me, the fundamental goal is to A, use digital data, if, you, if you're able to, to identify the yeses so that you don't waste marketing dollars, especially promo codes, et cetera, on them because they're going to buy from you anyway. Maybe they are better served through a loyalty program or an advocacy referral program, right? Because they, they love your brand, they're brand champions, right? So treat them differently. The ones, again, can you identify the no's? If you're not going to buy, no point wasting your Facebook, Google ads on them. Point is the maybes, right? Can you nudge them towards a yes? Can you nudge most of them towards a yes, right? So that's the typical, again, conceptually, when we try and look at some of these marketing campaigns, that's where data plays a very critical role. It kind of helps you hopefully segment and find out which audience segments kind of are important and where do they sit in the yes, maybe, no camps? And, you know, who do you focus on? And I think there, one of the things that we've learned is you know, it's important. This element of segmentation is critical, right? Understanding customer personas, what matters to them, what are the trigger points that matter, what story or formats matter to them. Though that art, you know, marketing is and will remain an art and a science, a combo of it. But that art and that art element is very critical, right? I'm the, the first one to say that two things. A, non-digital channels work very well in various cases. It's not just that digital is a magic wand. B, the creativity angle matters. And creativity is not just about an emotive campaign. That's great. But creativity is also in the business model, in the offering, right? So when you think of creative, let it not just be about, oh, what a lovely TV ad I saw and I, you know, it, it, got, it got me tear jerking. That's a part of it, right? That's the relatively old school that, oh, I saw this lovely creative insurance ad from Thailand and, you know, it was tear jerking. Great. You might remember it. But what happens next in the in the customer's journey, right? Are they, you know, is it just enough to show them one ad or do you need to follow up with a few other emails or a few other ad messages or if after seeing the ad, if they're likely to search, uh, you know, do I show up? Like I'll give you a real example in Singapore. 
This is about a decade ago. I don't know if you guys have heard uh, and hopefully never had to encounter them, but I don't know if you guys have heard or seen this brand called Cat Cheating Spouse. Now, for those of you in Singapore, if at all you have heard of them or seen uh, seen them, it's a yellow yellow logo, yellow brand. And the only place you may have seen them is on taxi bumper stickers. And one fine Saturday morning, I got a call from uh, call from the CEO. And I wasn't married back then. So, uh, but still it was very intriguing when you get a call from a CEO of Cat Cheating Spouse. And he says, you know, why don't you come over? I got to discuss something. And he says, look, uh, business is great. A lot of people cheating in Singapore, be it in you know, the marital front or the corporate front. So uh, good or bad, his business was doing well. So I said, what's the problem? He said, look, you know, I've been advertising on taxi bumpers for the last decade and I spent $40,000 a month. Great. You know, I think awareness is great wherever taxis go. You know, people know cat cheating spouse. Okay. So I said, what's the problem? He said, the problem is, you know, his son was just about taking over the business. And he said, the problem is uh, my son showed me this thing called Google. And, you know, when I type the word cat cheating spouse, I don't show up, uh, but some, uh, you know, competitive private investigator businesses show up. And I love the look on his face because he just thought, you know, just because he owns the brand, he owns the real estate on Google. And that's exactly when he realized that just by advertising, by that stimulus, that trigger message, it's not enough that people are going to remember him and buy. A lot of us, you know, tend to remember it, remember the brand or the tagline or the logo, and we search. But if you don't show up on search, someone else, your competitor could come and, you know, be either the ad number one or the organic rank number one and, you know, take away your traffic. So you're building the brand or the category. But if you don't show up on search when someone's searching or evaluating, you're actually do, doing yourself a disservice, right? You're potentially helping a competitor. For Nanyang Business School, for NCR, same case. Again, they presume that just because in the world of FT rankings and econ economists, they are the best schools in the world, you know, they're the kings of digital. Not at all. Google doesn't care whether you're Temple University, Phoenix University, or NCR, right? On Google search, you got to play the game by the rules, right? So again, point B, don't just leave it at that ad and that creative message. You've got to be on search. You've got to then ensure that when they come to your website, do they get the right information? Is the information findable, right? Uh, are you capturing the lead? Thereafter, hey, what happens to the people who leave? Can you follow through? Can you find who they are, right? So it, it's, a, it's a long process and that's what I'm going to be talking about. So just one message at this point in time is it's not just about spray and pray advertising and hoping people like your ad and will you know, buy it from you. Uh, that we live in a far more nuanced competitive world, right? So let's talk about a few digital growth fundamentals, uh, again, as principles to bear in mind. Number one is I think it's very, very important to be led by consumer insights and behavior and not tech. Point being, you know, two, three years ago, every other customer would come to us and say, oh, I want to do a Snapchat campaign. Anyway, I told you when I heard the word campaign, we wouldn't work with them. But the point is they were just chasing new technology. Today, the equivalent is TikTok, right? No one is talking to us about Snapchat. Five years, six years ago, it was about Twitter, right? So on and so forth. So I think technology comes and goes, but what matters is sure, nothing wrong with Snapchat, but as long as your customer is there, as long as that's the right channel, as long as you have the right budget to spend, right? So on and so forth. And so most customers come to us by saying, oh, I want to, do, I want to be on Facebook, whether they are B2B, B2C or government. Again, I'm not, the point is Facebook may or may not be the right channel. Even if you're B2B, LinkedIn, may not necessarily have to be your default channel to be there. There could be other ways of getting there. And I think the point is, again, the core principle of it's important to understand who your customer is, not just by demography. In fact, something I really detest is, again, in today's world, most customers come and say, oh, who's your customer? Oh, millennials. Two problems with that. Firstly, most people don't know what is the definition of millennial. They, they tend to confuse Gen X, Y, Z with millennials. Even technically, me being born in 83, I also qualify as a millennial. And even if you get the definition right, it's a very broad group, right? Digital allows you to narrow down not just by demography, but by behavior. You know, there could be two people born in 1990, but they could be completely different. So as much as possible, one must at least categorize them into as homogeneous segments as possible, or at least in the ideal world, Nirvana world of Amazon and Netflix, personalized, right? One-to-one. -one. So, I mean, broadcast was all about one-to-many, but can you at least get to one to some, to a meaningful audience, which is based on some common demography, psychography, behavior. In the ideal case, can you go one to one, right? So chase insights and not technology uh, and new tech. They keep coming and going. Number two, partnership versus ownership. Again, 
every business has limited resources. The likes, even the largest, no client has ever come in and said, I have lots of money. Everyone comes and says, you know, my budget's limited. And it's true, right? You have limited resources and you've got to take a hard call on what is it that you can and want to do in-house or should do in-house and what is it that your best, you know, best in your, uh, rather you kind of outsource it. Uh, Grab, for example, right? Grab has a 300 member digital marketing team. So it's larger than most agencies in Singapore. But there are certain things that they do in-house, certain things they know they can't attract and sustain the right talent and they would outsource. So for example, they've been working with us on data analytics for the longest time, but creative content, media buying, they're far better off doing it in-house because the scale intensity and pace required and the context required, no agency can kind of support that, right? So likewise, in your business, decide. I mean, typically I tell most of my clients that the creative content part of it, at least, I think it's best kept. So assuming you want to focus on, uh, you know, let's say search engine optimization, right? Uh, I think the content writing part of it, uh, if possible, getting it done in-house is fine. Uh, it's recommended, the design part, but the technical part of SEO, it's hard. Anyway, it's a hard skill set to kind of acquire and sustain in your organization. You're probably better off outsourcing that, right? Same for you know other, other aspects of your business. Number three is, again, a mindset thing about perpetual beta. Whether it's about your product or your marketing uh, initiatives, a lot of times founders or business leaders try and you know aim for perfection, right? But if you look at it, most of the digital tools, apps that we work, there's nothing, there's no perfect product that's released out there, right? If you, the best case is any app, right? They, typically they're, they're released when they're 70, 80% okay. And then, you know, you try and update your apps uh, every now and then, right? If you look at Gmail, technically Gmail is still on beta. There's, it's, it's a beta version and they've been improving, improvising on it, right? Likewise, when it comes to your, uh, because again, the element of, you got to balance. I'm not saying you release a, uh, a shoddy product out there, obviously not. But the point is you can start running pilots, right? You can release it to a small audience, test, learn, keep going. But again, don't kind of let perfection be uh, a barrier because, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's more of an illusion. You might have heard this term, obviously not uh, invented by me, uh, made famous by The Economist of, you know, three, four years ago. But the point here is, I think there's a lot of chatter about data. Now, but it's far more nuanced, right? Data is the new oil, surely. But the question is, how do you refine that oil? And how do you use that oil? And what do you use it for? And also what kind of data, right? So I think a principle that we typically try and use for our customers, let's say, for example, when we work with a bank or insurance is, A, what data is it that we have? What is it that we can collect? What is it that we can legally use and we can't use? Also, there's a whole process of cleaning data because you know data comes in so many structured unstructured formats right csv uh, it could be in uh, database formats whatever the question is how do i clean that and make it into the right structure what insights can i gain out of the data data in its raw form has no value hence you may have the oil but how do you refine huh? it's the refined product of the oil that you know commands a higher premium and then bigger question is how do you activate and use it there are so many companies out there who collect data uh, you know, for example, I can't name the bank, but uh, one of our first projects in the banking space was to work with the bank to improve credit card signups. And they had so much data about users' demography, you know, what color do they like, what product do they like, so on and so forth. But eventually, you know, but they were struggling to kind of improve their conversion rates on credit card subscription. Now, eventually, you know, it was, it was as, I wouldn't say simple, it was a very tedious, long process, but it was eventually we helped them figure out that, you know, when one of the biggest roadblocks that we found was when people had to come and you know uh, fill up that subscription form for expressing interest for a credit card. The two fields where the highest drop-offs were when you ask someone for passport, NRIC, or salary. Either they didn't want to reveal or they didn't know, and they said, "Okay, I'll come back later," which never happened, right? And by making small tweaks there, believe it or not, we could drive 30, 35 percent increase in conversions. So sometimes it's it doesn't have to be a huge, big data analytics project. It's just that experimentative mindset to figure out where the roadblocks are and what tweaks to make to drive incrementally. It's never, nothing in life, I suppose, is linear. You will find two or three things that could you know, drive uh, pretty massive incremental growth. So again, point being, collecting data is, is fine, but the question is, what insights can you glean and how can you activate and what can you do with it to drive growth? Remember, all of this is great. All of marketing is great, but unless it's driving growth in terms of users, usage, and eventual revenue profit, it has no meaning, right? And of course, if you're doing something omni-channel across 
physical, digital, etc. Or we, it's a it's a given that you would want to have a consistent integrated approach so that hopefully the customer experience, you know, whether I'm calling Singapore Airlines on a customer service hotline or I'm chatting with them on a chatbot or Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, ideally the experience, the look and feel should be as seamless as possible and as consistent as possible. So those are five principles that I would urge you to kind of keep in mind as you think of uh, digital, right? And again, the reason I'm spending time on some of these fundamentals is again, simply because more and more people who come to us or who we work with are just so enamored by the news they read about digital marketing, which is just glorified by the likes of TikTok, Google, Facebook. They forget some of the core fundamental principles, right? And to me, uh, like this chart kind of captures at the end of the day, uh, you know, when we work with the marketing, uh, the marketing team or, uh, you know, a growth team or a, the tech team, I mean, the ultimate function is as a team, be it an agency partner, consulting firm or a, and the client side is, am I creating demand, right, by inspiring and influencing people? And again, that's where the, the triumvirate of tech, creative and media are critical, right? And then am I capturing that demand? Because like I said, in the, you know, in the case of catch uh, cheating spouse, you could create demand, you could create awareness, but if you're not capturing it, what's the point, right? So are you kind of ready, waiting? Is your point of purchase, is it good enough? There are so many people who just focus on the message and the channel, but their website is shitty, right? So you drive awareness, you drive traffic, but when people come, either it's not loading or the form is not loading, your mobile, your website is not mobile friendly. So, you know, it's a simple classic thing of before inviting guests home, ensure that your home is in order, right? So are you ready to kind of capture demand? Is your analytics set up well so that you can understand who's coming, who's buying, who's coming and not buying, so on and so forth, right? So then art and science has to go hand in hand. And then once you've captured demand, are you retaining it, right? It's important to kind of retain that demand because as we spoke about earlier, it's expensive to acquire new customers, especially if you're in a B2C business, it's very, very expensive. Uh, B2B could be longer, right? So once you've got it, are you kind of, uh, you know, are you kind of ensuring you're extracting enough value uh, to make your marketing efforts worthwhile? So just for example, I, I met a, a B2B uh, fintech startup yesterday. He had a very different perspective. And I'm meeting a lot of these startups today who have a completely different approach on marketing or advertising. So this gentleman says, look, uh, I have done zero marketing so far. Right? and marketing by the sense of Google, AdWords, et cetera. He said, my cost of acquisition in his business, which is a fintech business, he works with banks, is either coffee or whiskey. Right? He said, that's it. Right? And he said, that's, that's what's helped me get the right kind of B2B customers uh, you know, in the banking world. Uh, so all I'm saying is there are various different ways. You don't have to necessarily jump onto you know, Google, Facebook ads, so on and so forth. There are offline as well as digital channels. Of course, in his case, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's, he's been there, done that. This is the third time. So he has a network. If you're obviously starting from scratch, your context is different. So going back to my first point, calibrating ambition is different, right? So I want to obviously call that out. But all I'm saying is there are various ways that you can capture demand, create demand, and eventually very critical. A lot of marketers tend to forget this. A lot of traditional marketers only focus on top of the funnel. Am I creating awareness? And then hoping that will lead to business. And most of them, from at least what I've seen, they don't even care or focus or know how to focus on retaining demand. That's a loyalty team. But in today's world, that marketer or the chief growth officer has to drive all of this together. Right? And hence, this is the race framework that I'll kind of leave you guys with is most marketers are great or they focus or they've been taught or trained to focus on the first part, which is reach. You know, through TV, print, radio, Facebook, Google, etc. Can I amplify the reach of my brand, right? On some channel through some emotive campaign, which wins an award. That's what marketers, so marketers usually are perceived or trained to be com comms people, communications people, right? Uh, their gold moment in life is the award. I mean, those are important, great. But again, is it eventually driving sales? Is it driving user growth? Is it driving growth in usage, right? Are you driving loyalty, right? Those are critical core parts of marketing today, right? So beyond reach, you've got to ensure is the right message reaching the right people? Are they taking the desired action? The desired action can be, are they searching for me? So a lot of people ask me that, hey, you know, I'm doing all these brand campaigns. How do I measure? So sure, you can measure impression. You can measure reach, all of that. That's great. But one simple metric that I think has helped a lot of us is, has your two things gone up, right? If you have your analytics set up, has your volume of brand search gone up on Google or whichever search engine and has your direct traffic gone up? Because if people are 
seeing, hearing, listening to your brand message. And if that's resonating, if it's evoking positive emotion, if they're considering your brand, they are likely to search for you on a search engine or a competitive platform. So if I'm, let's say, so it could be Google, it could be a sky scanner if I'm an airline or hotel, or they may remember your brand and they may uh, directly type the brand.com name and come, right? So two simple uh, measures is increase in brand search and increase in uh, direct uh, traffic, right? And then are they eventually converting? This is, I mean, you know, this is paramount. I can't impress enough as to how important this is. This is basically the destination where you're driving people to. App, website, microsite, what have you. Or it could even be an event or a roadshow or a shop. You know, at the end of the day, I could have a million people come to my physical shop, but if all of them turn out to be window shoppers, what's the point, right? How do you convert those Two things, right? How do you convert people walking in to customers, be it in real life or on digital shop front? And for, you know, if it's e-commerce, chances are your conversion rate is 1%, 2%, 5%, let's say. But what about the 95? Once they come and go away, it's very hard to win them back. And you may not even know who came and who left. But there is technology out there to kind of help you, you know, capture some through some forms, capture email by giving promos, et cetera. You could potentially retarget them using certain digital ad mechanisms, so on and so forth. But the point is the marketing team or the marketer has to focus not just on the R, but the e, A, C, and eventually the E. And once you have the customer, has he or she started using it, right? So if it's, let's say an app, right? Have they downloaded it? Have they become a paid customer? Are they, it doesn't matter if, I, if I'm a paid customer and I'm not using it. There are, you know, at least three, four apps on my phone where I've downloaded it. I've even paid it and I've kind of you know, sucked into that message and I've paid it, but I'm not using it, which is not a great sign, right? And then other day you want people to use your product so that I have a good experience and I keep paying again and again uh, and not just paying because I forget to kind of unsubscribe and hopefully I can bring in other customers, right? So that engagement, post-purchase engagement is very critical, right? So like I say, most marketers in this part of the world are very focused on reach and click the the you know, can, am I getting the click? Am I getting the reach? But I think digital's power is in the post-click journey, right? Remember that loop that you ideally need to trigger, right? And again, two simple philosophies. I'm showing, you know, there's an old brand here, Coca-Cola. The one on the left is from Shopee. Is again, at the end of the day, remember what matters is are you driving a personalized customer experience, right? So don't just have a spray and pray generic message to everyone on every channel, right? Uh, like I said, don't treat everyone as a millennial or a Gen X or a Gen Y. Each individual human is different. We have a different DNA, different preferences. So if I am into gaming, don't try and sell me shoes or uh, sell me a coffee machine, unless you have insights that, you know, I'm a gamer who likes that. Or maybe I could influence uh, my wife to, you know, uh, buy a pair of women's shoes or maybe gift, unless you have that insight, right? So one is about how can you use data to kind of understand your customer audience segment in terms of their intent, in terms of their uh, preferences, and then take that to kind of personalize not just the messaging, but also the product, right? Uh, I mean, I just used the Coke example loosely because to me, it's interesting that, you know, a company with 120 plus years of uh, history and legacy and heritage, if they could kind of take this bold decision of playing around with their uh, you know, what a marketer calls the holy grail, the logo and what they call intellectual property. I'm very sure new companies can definitely try and do something similar. So are you doing something uh, that is personalized in terms of product, packaging, offering, pricing? Are you kind of, uh, you know, ensuring that something that evokes positive emotion and, you know, people can relate to, right? So that's the, hopefully you remember the, you know, the, the game is to kind of trigger that loop and as much as possible, use data to understand, get insights and drive personalized experiences, and remember the race philosophy, yeah? And so, you know, in this whole game, there are, again, it's not just about the media channel of Google, Facebook. There are a few components that matter. People, who is going to drive this? Is it internal? Is it external? Agency, hybrid, internal model. What's the team structure? What's the incentives? You've got to think about the people, the process, right? Just, you know, the challenge with digital is, the myth is digital is cheap and it's accessible and it's easy. It's accessible and easy. It just takes a credit card to start running ads on Facebook, Google, but you know, it's hard and it's expensive to sustain. The likes of Google, Facebook, do not, they don't differentiate between a PNG or a startup, right? They are here to make money. They're for-profit companies. So even if you're advertising, you got to ensure that you have the right team, right process, right structure, uh, and the right know-how to drive your end goal of growth, right? What kind of data can you collect 
uh, legally? Can you use legally? Do you have the right infrastructure? So many companies don't have a CRM to capture first party email or mobile data because they're still focused on creating awareness. They'll come to my website and they'll buy, right? But if you're not collecting data about users or customers or prospects, and if you're not doing something about that, that's a disservice. And eventually, you know, of course you need technology, right? Your own CRM, your own DMP, CDP, what have you. That's a, that's a topic for another day. But I think it's important to bear in mind that you've got to think beyond the media channels and the creative, uh, the emotional creative messages and a far more holistic level. Because that's what hopefully can help you orchestrate a you know, personalized customer experience, which hopefully eventually leads to growth and profits, right? And I'm running short of time, but I'll kind of um, accelerate a bit more. And I'll take you through, you know, in segment three, I'll take you to three or four pointers to kind of just bear in mind that, you know, this is a long game. The other thing is, you know, people obviously, unless you calibrate expectations and ambitions, uh, the saddest outcome is, you know, you try digital, every, you know, big or large customers, they would come and say, oh, uh, I want to do a two month pilot. Uh, and they would expect the world's going to change. Of course, when we were younger as an agency, we would do that. Today, we're like, hey, unless it's a, it's a meaning, and it's not about the money, but it's just that everything takes time. It's a long journey. You've got to be in it for the long haul because it takes a lot of experimentation on various parameters to figure out the secret sauce that's going to work for your uh, organization, right? So first thing is the team. I always start with people and team because the media channels and the tech is only as good as the people running it, right? And we've seen broadly five kind of companies. There are still some who are digitally, I would say digital denial, but they would say digital doesn't matter. You know, I'm just going to, I'm happy doing my offline. Nothing wrong with it. That's fine. Then that's cool, right? Most are in this organization called Digital Magic Woman or Man, where they hire this one digital expert, typically an intern or a junior fresh graduate. Again, nothing wrong with the age. But the point is, just because someone is a good user of Facebook, Google, or some technology, doesn't necessarily mean that they have the right business context. Remember, the purpose is not to run have a great social media post that goes viral, right? Because by definition, uh, you know, by, you know, not everything will go viral and you can't engineer virality. You can't plan virality. It kind of, you can, and you can kind of ensure that your content has wings and the process to kind of get there once in a while. But again, even if one post goes viral, so what? Is that going to lead to sustainable growth, predictable revenue? Chances are not. I mean, you look at a side. He had one of a super hit, Gundam style, second one, even he couldn't make that fly, right? Because by definition, you know, it's not something that's predictable, scalable, and sustainable. Then you, of course, have digital islands where you have a good, strong digital marketing team supporting different functions. And then, of course, there are organizations which are, you know, the ones on the left-hand side in my first slide who are digital natives or where digital is infused into different parts of your business, not just marketing, but customer experience, call center, uh, even your brand research teams or even your finance or HR teams, right? So those are a different beast. So one is you've got to A, acknowledge where you are and, you know, ideally where do you want to be and how quickly can you kind of get there and accordingly have expectations. Next is, you know, it's like I said, it takes time. It's a funnel, right? So this is from a real uh, a B2B professional services company where their goal is to kind of, they sell office design services. So they are reaching out to the admin procurement uh, uh, the chief HR, HRO officers to kind of excite them to kind of, you know, come to them when they think of uh, redesigning their office space, right? So it takes time. You, you know, when they started three years ago, they just had a website and nothing else, right? They were not capturing forms, no leads, no lead nurturing, no planned targeting as to which kind of organizations they want to reach out to. But three years later, they have a decent funnel uh, where, you know, they exactly the economics are fairly clear that, okay, I get this amount of traffic. These many people subscribe to my newsletter. I've got so many leads. Now, again, the words like leads can be very misleading, right? Uh, because lead, a name and email ID is a lead, but is that a qualified lead? So we, we then break it down as to MQLs, marketing qualified leads, where people have expressed a uh, desire that, you know, they want to uh, learn more or find out more about the business and the offering. But that's still not enough because maybe they're not the right kind of clients. Maybe they don't have the budget. Maybe the timing is not right. So then you further segment after you call or meet them, you further look at a smaller segment, which is sales qualified, where they seem to be a good brand that you want to work for. You want them as a customer. They have the budget. Or they have the use case. Timing is good. So then you think of them as SQLs. And then you, of course, it's a sales conversation. In their case, it's an offline sales conversation where it converts into an opportunity and a client. 
And when you have this funnel, today they're at a stage, it's taken them three years to kind of get there. And it's important to get this expectation calibrated because again, they fell into the right hand side of my first slide where they didn't have VC money to just burn a million a day. And in case you, you know, by the way, that's not a joke. There are companies in Singapore like the Godaj and the Shopees of the world who spend close to a million a day on Google, Facebook, right? Uh, so, but most of us would probably fall in the category of a few thousand dollars a month on advertising. But uh, point being, it takes time. So you've got to figure out a mechanism or model which allows us to study, investigate, and figure out what's my funnel and hence what's my unit economics. How many, what's the right kind of website traffic and MQLs and SQLs I need to get that one client and what's the total cost, right? So measuring this, again, it seems easy. Uh, you know, just by having a Google Analytics, it wouldn't do. You've got to kind of think it through, plan it. You may need a multiple tools to kind of do this. But as the business owner, CEO, you've got to have your eyes set on this, the numbers, right? And in terms of metrics, obviously, at the end of the day, you want to look at revenue, profits, compound and growth. But even I think, you know, one step before that, I think what matters is, A, definitely don't just settle for your Facebook lights and share. And those are great ego metrics. Feel good about it, but then please do forget it. Beyond that, focus on, you know, if 100 people are coming to your website, how many of them are converting to a lead? How many of them are purchasing? How many of them are actually repeat buyers? How many of them are referring, right? So what's your total cost of acquisition? And again, here, people tend to make a mistake. They only think of cost equal to media cost because their mindset is digital equal to media, right? But total cost is your salary, people cost, right? Your office space, if at all you have an office, right? Your tech tools, you might be using, uh, you know, analytics tools, you might be using some UI, UX tools, et cetera. So people, tech, media, all that agency cost, all that cost inclusive is your total cost. And you've got to use that cost as a total cost as a numerator, right? And of course, if once if I'm a customer of your business, what's my net customer lifetime value, right? Am I using it? Am I using regularly? Am I paying regularly? Because there are so many little steps, right? Like for example, in our business, just because I have a customer doesn't mean he or she necessarily pays or doesn't mean he or she pays on time. So I got to keep a hawk, you know, a hawk's eye on who's a good paying customer, who's a good paying repetitive customer. Ideally, who's a good paying repetitive customer who has brought in other good paying repetitive customers, right? So you've got to be able to measure that. And today the tools, technology is there. It's just that that mindset and that process and the right kind of people are required to do so. And of course, you know, as you mature, the other fallacy of our world of digital is you know, we fall prey to what's called last click attribution, right? So assuming you're using Facebook ads or Google ads and someone clicks on Facebook and comes and becomes a lead and eventually buys. We fall prey to this logic that, oh, only the Facebook ad is working. Everything else doesn't work, right? Not true because that's what's called last click attribution. You're only giving credit to that last click. But what about the TV ad that you ran, which created good awareness? What about that holding at Changi Airport, right? What about the digital brand awareness campaign you ran on YouTube, which did not have a click button, but maybe had a very good effective uh, cost effective reach right so there are tools out there in the google stack adobe stack or third party tools which allow you to do what's called you know data driven or machine learning driven attribution modeling and this is very critical as you mature because eventually you want to know which channel should get how much credit for success it's like let's say soccer right it's typically you obviously get excited about the striker who scores the goal but does it not matter who who the center left or the center right who passed the ball? Does it not matter about the defender who defended and then kicked the ball forward, right? So every, in a team sport, in a multi-channel mix, what matters is that mix and what's the weightage. And this is important because this data could rather will determine your next year's budget, right? Otherwise, you're likely to just be subjected to, you know, this last click philosophy that on only Facebook ads are working, right? So let's only do that. Very rarely have I seen uh, clients or projects where only one channel has worked, right? So you experiment with different and then you use tools. Of course, initially when you're starting off, it's difficult, right? Because these tools could be expensive, right? But at least bear in mind not to fall prey to uh, last click attribution, right? And the last point here is about, again, segmenting your audience, right? Very, very critical. So this is from a telco that we work with is we help them kind of segment their audience or customer base into champions, loyalists, uh, into dormants, into people at risk of losing. It's the same yes, maybe no logic, right? And this is so powerful because, you know, by just doing this, they've been able to increase the efficacy and efficiency of their marketing because we have literally stopped sending promo codes to the loyal champions, 
right? Or to the no's who are not going to buy, who are going to leave and who are just there for monetary value. We would stop, segment them out and not market to them. We would look at the hibernating or the dormants of, you know, people who are in the maybe box, right? So again, whilst, you know, you see tech tools like Salesforce, Adobe, Oracle, but there are simpler, not maybe as deterministic, but simpler tools and ways to kind of do that yes, maybe no, and segmented ways of having meaningful, relevant, uh, responsible campaigns or messages for different audience segments. So as you mature, very, very critical to kind of segment your audience in different ways by dollar value, by payment terms, frequency of usage. And the more you start going deeper into those data segments, the more you understand about them and the more refined uh, you know, uh, your data becomes, the more defined, refined that oil becomes, right? And the last thing where I'll end today's session is really about you know a lot of uh, a lot of you have messaged me separately and a lot of clients also talk to me about hey great you tell me all of this if there is one channel that you would uh, you know uh, urge me to kind of focus on what should that be now I can only speak from my experience at Happy Market for ten years you know it's a non funded business services business no VC obviously would invest typically in a services business and the only way we grew this is by organic I don't think we've spend very little, maybe less than 5% of our total marketing budget on paid ads, right? It was all around organic and by organic, and you know, obviously I'm, uh, you know, uh, playing with the elements of organic and sustainability in terms of food and you know, whatever else that we do in life, because it's true in digital as well, at least that's what I've experienced is be it in terms of organic search, SEO or app store optimization, be it in terms of PR, be it in terms of, uh, you know, networking coffees and whiskeys, these are all relatively organic efforts. Of course, there is cost involved, not media, but people, time cost, tool cost involved. But uh, relatively, it's far more effective is what I found in terms of the quality of traffic, quality of deals that we have got. And the reason I say that it's sustainable is because, uh, you know, if you get, for example, if you get your search engine optimization right, so there is one piece of content, right? So like every month, religiously look at which is the best piece, best uh, landing page or website in Happy Marketer. For 10 years, it's still been one article that was written by an intern in 2010. It was an article comparing Air Asia and Singapore Airlines, I think. And the amount of traffic and leads that that one page has generated, it's immense. So it's like an asset that keeps growing. A paid ad, you know, the problem with the word campaign, you run a campaign, bang, you forget. All that effort for the creative messaging and the ads, all of that, one spike. It feels exciting in analytics that, wow, I got a spike, it dies down. But... In fact, you know, one company that I would uh, love and urge you guys to kind of uh, emulate is HubSpot, right? HubSpot is a CRM marketing automation platform. They have mastered the art of what they call, they themselves brand and call inbound marketing, right? So they kind of thrive on this and there are, there's enough and more content on their free content on their platform, which kind of tell you that if you get certain content pieces right, and if you get your SEO right, they'll serve you for the next five, six, 10 years, right? Uh, so if you ask me one channel at the end of the day, that I would focus on. Now, this will take you time, six, nine, 12 months to kind of get it right. It's an art and a science, takes a lot of effort and time. But again, that's something that I would crack because if the quality is good, uh, you know, it can, once it's there, it's a long lasting asset. And once you've through organic channels, PR, SEO, app store optimization, you've figured your uh, unit economics of your funnel, once you've raised some funding, that's fine. Then you use that series A, series B playbook to kind of burn cash and, you know, scale that engine. But without proving the unit economics of the funnel, the risk you run is you spend millions on ads. Great. But your people are coming to your site, but not buying. There are leakages in your funnel, right? So the philosophy is simple, right? At the end of the day, philosophically, conceptually, there are two kinds of knowledge discovery moments. Either you are an active intent driven moment where you're actually searching for what you want or you're passively discovering. And the irony is, if you just think of marketing equal to advertising, advertising by definition, be it TV, radio, print, or Facebook, Google, is a very uh, intrusive, disturbing process. We don't open a paper, newspaper to see ads. I don't open TV to see ads. I don't open YouTube to see ads. The only marketers do that, right? Only marketers love seeing their ads and campaigns in the news. So it's by definition a very disturbing process. So between the two, I would rather focus on active intent driven search because when I'm searching something, clearly there's an intent to find out more. And then not showing up there is criminal. It's the same cat cheating spouse example. And you could do all the best branding in the world. It's the NTU example, the INSEAD example. You could do all of that. 
But then when people are searching for the best MBA degree in Singapore or best home loan Singapore and your product or your website doesn't show up, what's the point, right? So that's something I would generally urge that it's something that I've benefited from, our business has benefited from and some of our clients as well. And again, right, the fundamental is the model has shifted. Is This is the old, in fact, this is from a slide deck from PNG, is the old classical model of stimulus, first moment of truth, second moment of truth, that I advertise, people hopefully see it, it resonates with them, they go to the shelf, they buy my soap or conflicts, they like it, they go home like it, they keep coming. But what's changed is there is a zero moment of truth. And from the colors, as you see, this is from obviously uh, promoted by Google, is today, no, that stimulus alone is not important. I'm sure many of you would have seen these Edelman charts that advertisers or advertising has one of the least lowest levels of trust. I mean, have you ever seen an ad which says my product is average or my startup's not cool enough, right? Everyone says, you know, my product's the best and it's going to change the world and, you know, it's the next big disruptor, et cetera, right? So because trust is low, chances are people are going to search, compare, evaluate, right? Now that could be TripAdvisor for travel. A lot of younger travelers are searching. They start their journey on Instagram search, hashtag search. It could be searching on Facebook, LinkedIn. But for the purposes of, you know, uh, the discussion, it's on Google or a search engine or a competitive platform, right? Skyscanner, for example, right? And you got to win that zero moment of truth game. So it's no more about just the ad, remember that, right? And there are four kinds of moments of truth. People wanna know, I wanna know moments. Like I wanna know, I wanna find out more about your product, your founders, your teams, etc. I wanna go, if it's an event, if it's a webinar, if it's some sort of an activation, I want to do. People wanna learn how to use your product. People wanna figure out, you know, help kits, so on and so forth, calculators, tutorials, etc. And I wanna buy moments, right? Sometimes the buying process is not as seamless, like I said, it should be, right? So how do you win these micro moments and that's where race comes in, right? It's not just about the reach. It's about the search. It's about the website experience. It's about the conversion. It's about the lead nurturing. It's about the SMS follow-up. It's about the purchase. It's about the receipt. It's about the onboarding, right? That entire loop. So I'll leave you guys with a couple of examples where, uh, and this is a fantastic area to kind of study. It's called the data content loop. And, you know, you'll find some global as well as regional examples where companies like Glassdoor, Zomato, Oyo in the region, they all have thrived on this data content loop and SEO. Is they've, cre- they've collected data based on you know, what people are searching, what people are reading, which page on your website are people spending time on. They've created content around that. They have done the SEO right. And it's a self-fulfilling wheel, right? Because, again, the goal of SEO, and again, if there are people uninitiated about SEO, it's not the ads on Google. Typically, the first three or four are ads. It's the listing below, right? And typical data shows that 70% of the clicks go to the first three links. In fact, there's a joke in our industry that the best place to hide a dead body is page two on Google because obviously no one goes there. In fact, if you're searching on mobile, page two doesn't exist. It's a scrollable page, right? So your goal should be what keywords are people searching for for products or brands in my industry? Which of those keywords have the highest search volume? Can I be on, how can I be on page one, right? It's not. It's a non-negotiable, right? Uh, and again, it's, it's a topic for a very detailed art and science discussion. No one knows the algorithm, by the way. So if you find any agency telling you guaranteed ranking, please question them. Don't work. I'm not saying don't work with them, but question them because no one knows the algorithm. It's a, you got to test and learn. And Google keeps changing the algorithm every six to 12 months, right? Same way, there is an optimization to be done on an app store. If you have an app, how do you ensure that your app is on the top 10 listing, right? You've got to be on the top 10 listing. People won't go below that. And in fact, there is this one gentleman uh, who's a big inspiration. His name is Rich Barton, a billionaire, uh, unheard of typically. He was ex-Microsoft. But his claim to fame is these three startups. And I'm sure you've either heard of them or used them, Expedia, Zillow, Glassdoor. And the beauty is what you see on the right. In the early days, the early, even post VC money, bulk of his acquisition actually came from search or direct. Direct meaning people knew Expedia.com, right? And people came there directly. So, but again, that was not driven through paid ads, right? And the economics changes. If you can ensure, and if you can, if you, especially if you're going to the fundraising, and if you can show that uh, your eventual VCs, investors, that you know, you've actually got this flywheel where you're using organic PR, SEO, ASO, et cetera, to drive traffic that's converting well, people are using, and you know, there's a flywheel that those people are using and they're bringing in other users, that's nirvana, that's gold. 
So if you study more about the data content loop that companies like Glassdoor, Zillow, Expedia have used, there's enough literature around this as to how they've used organic and direct as a mechanism to drive and grow their business. So that's, I mean, if I were you, especially as young businesses, having done this with one or two businesses of my own, I would generally focus on this element of organic digital marketing, which is sustainable, relatively cost-effective. And, you know, this whole paid media game, the only person... Uh, it's it's effective if you know how to use it well and if you have the budget. Like I said, if you're in the grabs of the world and you've got to grow quickly, it's absolutely paramount and critical. There, the question is not about how much money do you spend, but how effectively do you spend it, right? But if you don't have that money, if you're you know in the early stages, which many of us are, the question is how do you kind of create that data content group, right? And it's not just Western brands. I've picked some brands from Southeast Asia, India, where they have bootstrapped, where they've not even, you know, many of them may not even have raised VC funding and they hence don't have the large uh, VC-backed money for marketing, and they've used organic ways to grow their business, right? So you may want to read up about Happy Fox Zoho to figure out what's their playbook like, because typically these guys don't get enough press. It's it's the other SoftBank supported companies which get uh, a lot of press around, you know, what they're doing, the marketing blitz, etc. Right? And again, right? So there are a lot of studies that you'll see. This is from a marketing mag survey. Typically, you'll see that in terms of channels search. Not only is it cost effective, the quality is good. Why? Like I said, because you know, whether even if you're running paid ads, rather than Facebook, LinkedIn, which is more passive discovery where you're disturbing a user's behavior, even if you're running paid ads, a paid search is at least, you know, the ad shows up when someone's searching. So there is relevance. Ideally, it should be organic. You're not paying for it, you've figured the SEO or the ASO game, right? Uh, and again, one channel here that I'll call out, which again gets it's the least sexy digital channel, but I have found it to be extremely powerful is email, right? Email, email. I mean, SMS could be, but email, again, first party data. If you use email well to run personalized nurturing campaigns on a regular frequent basis with personalized content and messaging, it can be a charm, right? Initially setting it up takes time and effort and money, but thereafter per email, you're not sending, you're not spending too much money, right? So weigh that quality versus revenue part well, because remember the goal is to drive growth. Goal is to drive profit revenue, CAGR. Goal is to drive conversions, right? Good quality conversions, right? And, uh, you know, um, as I end, I'll again repeat the fact that marketing is not equal to advertising. I mean, especially folks from Singapore, Indonesia, India, and the region, we tend to kind of combine these words all, all in one. Oh, I'm a marketing advertising professional. Advertising is a subset of marketing. Like I said, marketing's definitions have changed. Roles of CMOs are changing. You have to look right from the brand to the conversion, to the experience, to the whole loyalty loop, right? So you're no more just an ad guy, right? That just doesn't cut it. If you're an ad guy, that's fine, but you're just then you're just part of the larger process. You're not looking at marketing as a whole, right? And again, it doesn't have to be very expensive, right? A lot of startups, tech startups in the US, Europe, India, et cetera, like I gave you examples, would take the organic route first. Try using, I mean, I genuinely believe that before I spend a dime on Facebook and Google, I would fix my organic. I would figure out my unit economics. Only then, once I have enough confidence in my marketing funnel, then whatever money that I raise or I have or I you know, make from my customers, I could then decide to spend uh, you know, some of that on uh, paid media activities, right? So that's it. Uh, you know, from my perspective is... Uh, when you think of digital marketing, ensure it's not just about ads. Think of race. Think of the entire customer experience journey. Remember that loop. Think about personalization. And when you plan it, don't just think about the technology and the media, right? Because it skews your expectations. It skews your, you know, again, depends on the ambitions you calibrate. Also skews your expectations and your resource planning. The elements of people process kind of get sidelined. You just ex expect that, uh, come on, okay, I'm, um, I have a website, let's just run some ads and it will work. Uh, it's not as simple, right? It's a process. And remember, it's a marathon. It'll take two, three years, four years to kind of figure that out, right? So that's it from my side. I know I've kind of uh, gone beyond time, uh, but hope it was useful. Happy to take any questions. I see a few on the chat and Q&A. Uh, Siddhi, uh, should I take it directly or would you guys want to facilitate? How would you like to do it? Um, um, Prantik, you could take it directly. Uh, but before that, I have a question. Before we, uh, I'll raise the questions from the Q&A as well. But before that, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? I can. 
Okay, so uh, Prantik, my question is: uh, keeping Thai Singapore as as a small business as well, what we suffer is, and and your your whole this one hour fifteen minutes kind of resonated so well, and we realize what we are doing wrong. One definitely is mapping the customer journey, but. Uh, beyond the customer journey where we struggle is because if you know if you will we are a b2c we are targeting customers directly we are not targeting businesses how do we ensure that they are um, converted in the sense when i say i'm not talking about hey become a member or join us as as a clicker form or whatever but i want to see where all have they engaged and the only brute force that we do is for every session that we do we map that but in your experience is there a better way or a, or a, a, I mean, it's a very tactical question but are there tools available where we can map the customer journey and engagement in a better fashion yeah so of course there are you know i think one of the typical simple tools that i start with is google analytics right if it's again a digital customer journey is just sometimes just looking at so if you again we can have an offline chat around this it will at least give you a good gauge of you know what are people searching where are they coming from what devices what page are they spending time on where are they going there after so there there are certain segments of google analytics report if it's set up well which shows you the the journey and the number of people who are kind of part of that uh, part of that journey so i think to me that's a good starting point of course a lot of businesses run surveys polls or uh, have focus groups to kind of add to that but to me uh, just sometimes most businesses don't make the most of the free google analytics tool it could give you an interesting perspective of that trajectory and that journey and then you you could use that data point to make certain hypotheses and you know start doing things differently i would put these data points on my channels and again you, know, you probably would have uh, I wouldn't spend too much time effort money on getting expensive tools but first I think a good starting point would be to look at your own database your own website your own email stats uh and I think again like I said nothing is linear small little tweaks could give you nice little bumps in whatever goal that you try to drive got it thanks Pradeep I'm, I'm mindful about the time so I'll quickly pick up one more question is my voice there quite by any chance I can hear you I see a question from Ashish Um, yes if you could pick that up please sure. is digital marketing more relevant that's a very good question no i mean i think you know it's uh, at happy marketer for example we most of our revenue comes from b2b right rolls royce into it uh, even amazon mastercard uh, who obviously have b2c and b2b uh, so not really b2b the sales cycle is longer the uh, the techniques are different uh, so for example in b2b most customers what they do is they do a abm what they call abm account based marketing so instead of a very broad approach let's say into it says you know what i want to reach out to smes or medium sized businesses in the food industry right so then we would figure out so email becomes a big thing uh, seo search engine optimization becomes very very big it could be linkedin sales navigator through which you're reaching out to people again uh, it's not just digital channels right it could also be event sponsorships or content partnerships with certain media channels so definitely uh it's applicable and relevant to both in fact i mean from my experience i mean happy marketer itself is a b2b company and you know a bulk of our uh business has come both from the coffee sessions and whiskies i think that i still think is uh you know very very critical especially in a b2b business because it takes convincing when you're selling software or selling some b2b uh you know manufacturing product etc so i think there's no take going away from that uh but even in the digital part like i said i would first focus on the organic parts of marketing so for example we're working with a fintech company we're focused on content marketing right now we're focused on helping them drive their seo we're focused on ensuring they're getting the right kind of pr digital pr or offline pr doesn't matter right and we're seeing again we're doing it in bits and pieces to see what kind of traction or uh, results are we getting from that right and then as we collect the database uh, you know then we would run email nurturing campaigns right because there's no point running massive blitzkrieg ad campaigns that will happen later so if you see the likes of uh, you know a transferwise for example today they would be running very large offline bus stop digital campaigns on flights all of that right because they are at a very different level also they as you go larger many of them run those simply for investor confidence because maybe they are getting closer to an ipo right so the objective could be very different so sometimes uh, this is also a critical point why you are using what's you know why you kind of leveraging marketing is critical is it for investor relationship is it for employee or employer branding 
Uh, because again, uh, like my friend told me last evening that for his business, in the initial three years, most of his customer acquisition happened through coffees and whiskeys. And all he said that from a digital perspective, all that he's done, he is ensured that he has a very good website, both from a UX perspective, searchability perspective, content perspective. He's focused on his SEO because even though he's having the coffees and whiskeys, he's mindful that when that guy goes back to his office or home, he's likely to search. And he wants to ensure that, you know, that digital becomes a good follow-up channel uh, on its own so that the right information is there. There is some credibility out there through testimonials and content and all of that. So digital is not the primary sales channel for him. It's more a, uh, you know, a backup, a backup channel in that sense to kind of drive the credibility. Thanks, Prantik. I'm mindful of the time as well. I'll just quickly read uh, a comment that is on the chat. Some very good takeaways, Prantik. Thanks. You delivered your final sprint with a good punch. This is what Jawahar Kanjilal, founder of Streams, um, Team Streams, said in the chat. Thank you so much for that, Prantik. And uh, some of the, uh, speak, uh, the attendees have come back and asked us, how do we get in touch with Prantik? So are you com uh, would it be through us or are you comfortable sharing? No, I'm, uh, just, I'm just sharing my email ID below. Feel free to drop me an email there. If you like, I'll circulate the deck through Sudha and Sidi. And otherwise, LinkedIn is great. So just drop me a LinkedIn connection uh, or an email. Great, Tantik. This was really useful from, from a small business like ours. And I consider ourselves a small business. We, we, we got a lot of takeaways. So thank you so much for spending a Thursday evening with us and sharing your experience with us. Thank you so much. Before, before we close the session, uh, folks, we request you, there's a poll that really helps us. To, uh, if you could fill that poll in and, um, you know, wish you a very uh, lovely day moving forward. Thank you so much, Pantik, once again. Thank you.